Hello. Today, I would like to talk about a book which I have already mentioned in a previous uh, video on this channel. And uh, here it is, uh, The Diaries of Sir Ernest Mason Sato, 1861 to 1869, uh, edited by uh, Professor Robert Morton of Chuo University, Tokyo, and myself uh, from Kyushu Institute of Technology. Um, so uh, it was published in 2013 uh, through Eureka, which Eureka Press, which is a uh, Japanese publisher. Uh, and um, it's a high quality edition, um, mainly intended, I think, for libraries and uh, research institutes. Um, I don't know if it will ever be available in a cheaper edition, which might be more affordable for students or uh, researchers uh, to buy individually. Uh, but I, I would like to hope that it could be at some point. Anyway, today, um, what I want to do is to read the foreword by Sir David Warren, who is a former ambassador, uh, uh, British ambassador to Japan, and also the editorial preface, which was written by uh, Robert Morton and myself. And so you can then um, see what the book is about and how it fits in with uh, Sato's uh, famous memoir, A Diplomat in Japan, published in 1921. So let's get going. Um, all right, so first of all, I will read from the foreword. Um, so here we go. Uh, the life of the Victorian diplomat and scholar, Sir Ernest Sato, was closely bound up with Japan. He served as a student interpreter and later Japanese secretary in the British legation from 1862 to 1884. Later in his career, after service in Thailand, Morocco and Uruguay, he returned to Tokyo as minister, then the most senior diplomatic position at the British embassy from 1895 to 1900. He published a celebrated memoir of his earlier service, a diplomat in Japan, which recorded his impressions of the 1860s, the extraordinary decade he had witnessed as a young diplomat, as Japan struggled out of the seclusion of the Tokugawa era and the fog of civil war to reestablish effective centralized government with the restoration of the Emperor Meiji. His eyewitness account of Japan in this turbulent period is of great historical importance. It enables us to get a flavor of a volatile, sometimes violent era during which Japan began to reorientate itself from a country effectively closed to the world to one engaging increasingly assertively with the great powers. Like many pioneers of the British Empire in the 19th century, Sato came not from the aristocracy or the upper classes, but from the upwardly mobile middle class of trade and office life. He was born in June 1843 in Clapton in London, the third son of a Swedish merchant, and entered University College London in 1859, taking his BA in 1861 and coming first that year in the examination for student interpreters to serve in the consular service in the Far East. Sato was clearly a student of languages of precocious brilliance. In his memoirs, he says that his interest in Japan was sparked by his brother's borrowing an account of Lord Elgin's 1858 mission to Japan, which saw the signature of the Treaty of Amity and Commerce from Moody's circulating library. He began some uh, rudimentary study of Oriental cultures at University College London, but his serious linguistic study began when he reached China, where he learned some written and spoken Mandarin. It was then thought that a knowledge of Chinese was required for Japanese study. His single-minded study of Japanese and determination to master the Japanese script from the moment he arrived in Japan in September 1862 was a formidable task in the absence of Japanese teachers who knew any English, even with the assistance of an American missionary who had published an early teaching manual. His diaries recount his endless linguistic curiosity as well as his restless and energetic recording of everything he saw and experienced in these strange and unfamiliar environments. 
We tend to see Sato's distinguished career in Japan through the prism of his memoirs, published in 1921, when he was 78, laden with honors, Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, membership of the Privy Council, honorary degrees from both Oxford and Cambridge universities, Sato judiciously reflects on his life. His book inevitably paints a picture tinged with respectability and discretion, sanitizing his more youthful and callow judgments. He drew on his personal records, but adjusted and adapted them. The unexpurgated diaries to a degree redress the balance. The Japan in which Sato arrived in September 1862 was in a state of flux. The Tokugawa shoguns had been in control of Japan since the unification of the country in 1600. The black ships of Commander Perry had begun the process of forcing Japan to open up to foreign trade and diplomatic contact in 1853. And the world's great powers had followed this up with treaties signed at the end of that decade to enforce their commercial and legal interests in this regard. The treaties were unequal, giving foreign powers extraterritorial rights as well as control over tariffs. Coupled with the devastating economic impact of suddenly liberalized trade, the impact was effectively to provoke a civil war between different factions on the merits and demerits of accepting this force majeure by the imperial powers. The main conflict was between nationalist imperialists who saw an opportunity to exploit the enforced end to isolation to Japan's advantage and the shogunate increasingly unable to hold the ring between those who wanted to remain isolated, those who wanted to resist the foreigners invasion and those daimyo feudal lords who saw a chance to avenge their exclusion from government under the Tokugawa regime. This period, known as the Bakumatsu, was confused and bloody. Attacks on foreigners were common, and E. Naosuke, the prime minister who had signed the Treaty of Amity and Commerce with Britain and was in the vanguard of westernization, was assassinated in 1860. Sato arrived in Japan only days after the Namamugi incident when a British man, Charles Richardson, was hacked to death by samurai on the road between Tokyo and Yokohama for refusing to dismount when challenged. The dynamic of British diplomacy was, of course, imperialist. The 19th century was the era of power play among empires. Japan was not a colonized territory, but it was a country in which Britain and other imperial powers felt entitled to assert commercial and legal rights and enforce them on pain of bombardment where necessary. The confusion of the Bakumats period must nonetheless have made it immensely difficult, an immensely difficult environment in which to assert Britain's interests. With the weakening of the Tokugawa shogun's position as the factions within and outside the government jockeyed for position, with whom were the treaty powers to negotiate to secure the interests of their traders and residents? Sato's writings betray no self-doubt about the role that Britain assumed on this new Asian frontier of empire. Looking at his diaries and the more measured account he gave of his life at that time many years later, it is interesting to speculate about his role in British policy towards Japan during this confused period. We should not overstress his influence. Sato was a young and inexperienced diplomatic interpreter. His linguistic brilliance, physical courage, and ability to make relationships of trust with some of the younger Japanese caught up in the maelstrom of a civil war were formidable assets of which his superiors made full use. Indeed, he moonlighted as a journalist from time to time and wrote articles for the Japan Times as early as 1865 and 1866, questioning the shogun's ability to maintain his position. But there is no evidence either in the diaries or in the more considered synopsis of events described that later appeared in his memoir that he was responsible for steering British policy. However, Sato was in the front line. In 1863, he was an eyewitness of the so-called Satsue Senso, the war between Satsuma and Britain, in which British forces bombarded Kagoshima in retaliation against the daimyo's refusal to make adequate recompense for the murder of Richardson and the shogun's inability to force them to do so. In 1864, he was the interpreter to Admiral Cooper in which capacity he came under fire 
during the bombardment of the Straits of Shimonoseki. That's Cooper, K-U-P-E-R, by the way. In, re in retaliation against the Choshu clan's attacks on foreign ships traversing the Straits. In 1865, he was an integral part of the British and French negotiations to secure the emperor's ratification of the treaties that the Tokugawa shogun had signed with them, achieving for a British diplomat the heartwarming distinction of translating the key document extempore in front of the French minister, whose interpreter could not read the Japanese script without his teacher being present. This was Palmerstonian diplomacy in the most unpromising, confused, and frequently savage environment. Sato's diaries give fascinating first-hand accounts of these events, and while there is no new material in the unexpurgated version that should lead us to assign him a greater role than the one he played, it is certainly true that he had an impressive ability to forge genuine relationships, even friendships, with individuals whose later careers were of enormous significance, such as Ito Hirobumi, four times prime minister, Inoue Kaoru, and the tragic rebel leader Saigo Takamori. The British minister, senior diplomatic representative for much of the time that Sato served in Japan was Sir Harry Parks. Sato's relations with him were difficult. Parks was a choleric and aggressive man and the diaries are peppered with outbursts of rage and display, displays of contumely at Japanese prevarication and unwillingness to make concessions. Sato's mastery of the language and unusual sensitivity to the way in which his Japanese interlocutors responded to British and other countries' pressure understandably color his attitudes. We can see from the diaries how this spills over into contempt towards his rougher tempered boss. And in a way with which modern readers may easily identify, this takes the form of the younger man seeing the older one, not only as uh, sadly dunderheaded, but utterly dependent on his interpreter's brilliance and perspicacity. I know pretty well from the tone of the letter to me that Parks finds himself at sea without me. And so in one of his nervous fits, he wrote in a way that he will probably regret afterwards, reads an 1868 entry. But for all the frustration that appears, what is the use of being a Japanese secretary if one's advice is never taken on Japanese matters? Sato rails at one point, there is also evidence in the diaries that Parks could take a challenge from his subordinate without automatically exploding, and from foreign office correspondence that he was more supportive of his staff than it may have seemed to Sato at the time. And the evidence also suggests that Parks, mindful of his wider responsibilities to the British community and of his experience of the civil strife in China 20 years before, was prudent enough to hedge his bets as far as committing British support to the daimyo against the shogun was concerned, until it was becoming clear that the shogun's time was up. Reading between the lines of Sato's rather dismissive references to the chief, we can see a degree of skill in Parks's ability to combine prolonged neutrality with an ability to come off the fence at the right moment, both in terms of influencing the outcome and of securing British interests in post-Meiji restoration Japan. The full diaries therefore supplement Sato's own account in A Diplomat in Japan with more immediacy and impact. These are records written sometimes in the heat of battle, sometimes shortly after witnessing events that would be traumatizing for modern sensibilities. His eyewitness account of the seppuku of the prisoner Taki Zenzaburo in March 1868, for example. The diaries are full of casual violence, as well as the risks and threats to all travelers at that time, such as disease and fire. Sato seems remarkably blithe in the face of danger. He welcomes a free and easy life with something of, of adventure, as he writes in 1864. Sato's style is functional rather than literary, but he has an eye for detail. The sights and smells of the Orient emerge from these pages. And intermittently, a novelist's or sometimes a cartoonist's eye for character. His entries record daily life among the small resident British community in Japan, as well as sharp and evocative portraits of what he saw as he traveled widely in the country. What people ate and drank, how they dressed, how they lived. His senses are alert and his sensitivity to Japanese psychology 
and to the shifting power relationships is acute. He does not conceal his intellectual and professional ambitions, but behind the cocky, slightly knowable air, we see a receptive and tough mind capturing a society on the edge of transition. We do, however, have to make allowances. The Sato on display here is a young, brash, and indeed arrogant mid-Victorian type. The young men dispatched to what was to all intents and purposes the wild east in support of Britain's imperial objectives at the edge of its Asian empire were plucked from school and university and had to grow up fast. Sato's daily entries, particularly during his months in China, record with an offhand candor that 21st century readers may find alienating a disdain for what some Victorians regard as lesser breeds without the law. Snowballed a few Chinamen, one of whom remonstrated with me in perfect English, he writes on 30th of January, 1862. As Robert Morton observes in his essay, No Longer the Same Moral Youth, Sato had little respect for the Chinese, regarding them as idiots at best, and he displays many of the casual attitudes that must have been current among many young men at that time of his class and background. Kicked my boy out, having put my shoes on for the purpose, he writes on 15th of June, 1862. A week later, the same hapless boy is kicked downstairs. Sato and some of the young interpreters go looting in Chinese temples, taking potshots at the de decorations. A reprimand by his superior is immediately ignored. The diaries are full of contradictions. Life in China is a social world, boozy, gregarious, loafing about, riding, card playing, and telling smutty jokes. At the same time, Sato is catching up on his reading, Scott, Eliot, Thackeray, the Nibelungen, Saga, and Spencer, and displaying the same restless inquisitiveness about Chinese language and culture that will later translate itself into expertise on Japan. For every entry that reads like Lupin Puta in the diary of a nobody after a night on the tiles, he was very screwed and talked all sorts of bosh. He confides about a colleague in April, 1862, while adding next day, of course, he declared that he had been as sober as a judge the night before. We find elsewhere, the germ of Sato, the scholar and intellectual. And he was a young man. I am 19 years old today. What a frightful age, he commiserates with himself at one point. Once established in Japan, however, getting to grips with the language and Japanese society, with the experience of the Kagoshima bombardment behind him, and beginning to establish the links with the emerging generation of Japanese leaders that would stand him in such good stead in his later career, some but not all of the callousness begins to slip away. There is almost nothing of Sato's more intimate personal life in these papers, although he has a pretty constant eye for the ladies, and there is a coy reference in Romanized Japanese late in the diaries to an unproven allegation of having fathered an illegitimate child. Words written for one's own eye alone often betray a sense of effortless superiority over everything and everyone with which the writer comes into contact, and Sato is no exception. But at its best, there is a cheerful, adolescent cynicism on display from time to time, which contrasts nicely with the persona of the grave elderly diplomat more usually identified with Sato. At a Tokushima banquet in August 1867, he generously records, Sir Harry is charmingly free and pleasant, says nothing about the relations of friendship between our two countries and the usual claptrap. More importantly, as early as March 1864, Sato is identifying his commitment to Japan as the driving force of his professional life. There is a poignancy in his respectful but regretful declining his father's request to him to return to Britain, and also a sense of having come through his own sentimental education. I could never conceal from him my propensities. One has the sense of a young man suddenly wrenched away from a secure middle-class life in mid-Victorian England, energized and excited as a participant in the great imperial adventure, and at the same time, discovering what makes him tick intellectually and in terms of his professional fulfillment. Was he eventually to be disappointed? He never became an ambassador either in Japan or China, the two countries with which he was most closely associated and in which his career culminated. 
he was able to lay some of the groundwork for the eventual Anglo-Japanese Treaty of 1902, as Britain detached itself from the other imperial powers and aligned itself with the rising Asian force of Imperial Japan three years before its defeat of Russia ushered in a new era of challenge to the established diplomatic order. But he appears to have been disillusioned, both professionally and perhaps also in his personal relationships with the Japanese leaders he had known as a young man, and in whose abilities and sense of a shared purpose he had placed trust. He was celebrated in Japan in an era in which those Westerners who committed themselves to building a bridge between East and West became celebrities. And even to this day, the name Sato resonates, not least with the many cherry blossom viewing Tokyoites who make their hanabi, hanami observances, that's uh, flower viewing observances, under the 88 cherry blossom trees he planted outside and inside the British embassy compound in Ichiban Cho, opposite the Imperial Palace. Some Japanese are surprised to discover that his name is less well known in his own country. But for the last 25 years of his life, Japan featured less prominently. He had an equally distinguished career as Britain's second delegate to the peace conference at The Hague in 1907, an early and unsuccessful attempt to map out the principles of world government. And as the author of the definitive and still being revised guide to diplomatic practice, he disposed of much of his Japanese library. He saw little of his two sons by his common law wife, Takeda Kane, one of whom predeceased him. And by the end of his life, his Japanese friends had died. The Anglo-Japanese treaty had failed and Japan was on the verge of embarking on its own military adventurism in China that would lead to the catastrophe of the Pacific War. He had chosen public life rather than the life of a scholar and he may have felt for all the honors heaped upon him that there could have been another, perhaps more fulfilling path. All this is speculation. The eruption of Japan onto the world scene in the second half of the 19th century and its subsequent development is one of the most remarkable stories in world history. The intense struggle for power between the forces of conservatism and reform that preceded the restoration of the emperor and the coming of the new order continues to fascinate us. Sato was there. His diaries are sometimes awkward to modern ears, but can also be strikingly evocative of a lost world. They are always observant and infused with a real understanding of the culture in which he found himself and the cross currents of the violent and ruthless politics he witnessed. And they give us a window into the era in which Japan turned its back on isolation and became one of the major powers of the modern world. David Warren, May 2013. And I should mention that he is uh, currently writing Sato's biography, uh, which may indeed be published quite soon, perhaps even in this year, 2022. Okay, now I want to move on to the editorial preface written by Robert Morton and myself. Um, so here we go. Editorial preface. Those who transcribe and publish diaries and letters often feel the need to justify the necessity for yet another such publication. This is certainly true in the case of Ernest Sato's 1861 to 1869 diaries, because it cannot be denied that much of them fairly closely follow what he wrote in his published work about the period, A Diplomat in Japan. Gordon Daniels, in his masterly introduction to the 18, sorry, 1968 edition of that book, commented, though there are divergences between the book and the original diaries, the two correspond so closely that the advantages of publishing the diaries as against reprinting the memoirs are little more than marginal. Obviously, the editors of this volume do not agree and with some reason. More than a third of the material in the diaries did not make it into the book in any form, and much that did was altered in ways that to historians of Bakumatsu politics and the British influence on them are highly significant. The largest section of the diaries that was left out of a diplomat in Japan is in fact the most interesting part on a human level. The account of Sato's stay in China from January to August 1862. A diplomat in Japan, as may be guessed from the title, confines itself to Japan. 
although Sato laments in it, I should like to dwell longer on our life in Peking. Sato's time in China was short, but it was probably the most intense period of his life. He was young, excited, enthusiastic, and everything he saw was strange and novel. He came from a sheltered background. So even relatively ordinary inter interactions with colleagues and other Westerners were considered worth noting down. Averaged out, he wrote far more per day during his time in China than in Japan. Around 20% of the diaries is taken up by the China section, although it represented less than 10% of his total stay. In the Japanese section, there are some long gaps, including one of almost a year, 30th of November, 1865 to 26th of November, 1866, in spite of the fact that he tells us in A Diplomat in Japan that his diary was kept almost uninterruptedly from the day I quitted my home. We do not know what happened during the gaps, but knowing Sato, they are very unlikely to have been empty of activity. But he had lost that initial impulse to record everything he did and saw and started saving his efforts for the more significant happenings, which of course were thick on the ground in 1860s Japan. For historians only interested in Japan, the main reason for reading these diaries is that they provide a franker, more immediate account of the events of the Bakumatsu period than a diplomat in Japan. As Daniels puts it, that book illustrates the force of hindsight. The diaries are Sato's raw and unmediated experiences. The publication of them allows a comparison of Sato's thoughts at the time things happened with how he felt years later and after he knew how events had turned out. In order to help readers compare the two versions, the editors have included sections of A Diplomat in Japan with the corresponding parts of the diaries. In the end, the diaries, rather than A Diplomat in Japan, are where we really see Sato as a human being. They reveal the trajectory of the scholarly, ambitious, but disrespectful teenager to the highly responsible, ultra-competent man of the world he had become by 1869. The change in Sato's character is very marked and his family must have been amazed by the stranger who returned to them after eight years away. The 18 year old of 1861 had been an innocent, gangly, religious, socially awkward boy, the product of a strict middle-class non-conformist family. On his return, he was confident, accomplished and worldly. He had developed the ability to hold his own with the most able men in Japan, and if his own accounts are to be believed, had become able to understand the complex and dynamic events of Bakumatsu Japan better than his boss, Sir Harry Parks. He was fluent in Japanese and had a decent knowledge of Chinese. In addition, he had strengthened his Western learning with a wide reading of classical English and German literature, and he had kept himself up to date with recent scientific works and the latest novels. He was fin financially independent and sexually experienced. His family must have sensed that he now inhabited an entirely different world from that he had grown up in. It is easy to imagine that his homecoming would have been difficult for some of his siblings, who must have felt some resentment at the return of the golden boy, who would have regaled them with stories of extraordinary experiences that they could never have hoped to have had themselves. It must have been hard for Sato as well, as his family represented the past he had so cut himself off from while he had been away. In the diaries, we see the moment at which he knew he had passed the point of no return, when he records his father offering him a hundred pounds a year for him to come home and study law in the entry of 26th of March, 1864. And he realizes that he cannot go back to his old life. Of course, the editors accept all blame for mistakes, although they would like to share some of it with Sato himself. As with all good learners of a foreign language, Sato peppers his writing with words that he has recently learned, but not necessarily quite understood. Place names in the Peking section are particularly difficult, as he often improvised and varied how he romanized them, and the city has changed immensely since his day. One village written in Pinyin Pali Juan, he wrote Pali Chuan, Pali Chuan, Pali Chuan, and Pali Chuan. In order to impose some order, 
Chinese words have been given in pinyin and in traditional characters in the hope of making them as easy as possible to understand and look up elsewhere uh, for both Japanese and English speaking readers. Sato's romanizing of Japanese left something to be desired in the early days. He wrote Yokuhama for Yokohama and Kyushu for Kyushu, but he eventually settled down to a style that is almost always comprehensible to someone who understands Japanese. Ultimately, the editor's plea can only be that they did their best, but there are some places, particularly in the Chinese part, where they, when they were reduced to making their best guesses. Sato went on to become minister to Japan and China, although unfortunately for him, neither country was deemed worthy of having a British ambassador in his time. So Sato never reached that rank. The editors are honored that one man who did, Sir David Warren, agreed to write a foreword to this volume. Although the job of ambassador minister has changed vastly since Sato's day, uh, Sir David's writing demonstrates that the caliber of the men who occupy the position has not changed. Sato might wish that some parts of these diaries had not been brought out into the open, but he would surely have been delighted that his, what he no doubt considered juvenile jottings are thought worthy of publication more than 80 years after his death. And perhaps more so that a distinguished successor to his position would have prefaced them with comments about him of such understanding and insight. And finally, we have a note. Uh, these diaries were transcribed from the originals stored at the National Archives in Kew, London. The illustrations and photographs are taken from the original diaries and are reproduced with the permission of the archives. The references are as follows. Um, so 4th November, 1861 to 15th of January, 1867 is reference PRO 30331, uh, where PRO 3033 is the class reference for the Sato papers. 7th of February, 1867 to 17th of October, 1868 is PRO 3033.15.2. And the third one is 6th of November, 1868 to 18th of April, 1869, which is reference PRO 3033.15.3. Robert Morton, Ian Ruxton, September, 2013. Uh, and that is uh, a good uh, summary of, well, in fact, it's a, it's a reading of the first uh, two things in the book, the forward and the editorial preface. So thank you for listening. Um, and uh, I will take my leave at this point. <laughs>